So it's after 10 p.m. on day seven, and that means that I don't get to play violin today. So I'm going to be talking about, um, well, first of all, why I didn't get to play today, and then some of the practice strategies I use um, when I can't play my instrument for some reason, like I'm in pain or I'm super busy or I'm commuting somewhere. Um, so I'll just talk about a few practice strategies after I explain why I was not able to get home today to record. Um, so first of all, um, on Mondays and Friday mornings, I play viola with some local uh, retired members of the community. Um, not necessarily retired, okay, bye. Uh, retired musicians. I play with, um, with a retired music teacher and an elderly realtor who plays viola with the symphony, but uh, she plays violin in our chamber groups and I play viola because it's like a handicap since we're the professional musicians of the group. Uh, the cellists are normally younger guys. Um, you know, we all just kind of, we hang out, we sight read, um, whatever we feel like playing that day. And uh, after I do two hours of chamber music on Monday mornings, I go straight to an acupuncture appointment that is in a city um, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes down the road. Um, I do acupuncture and chiropractic therapy regularly to help with all of the injury issues I have dealt with for many years. Um, these forms of therapy are something that's a little bit more preventative because I have been through physical therapy twice now and both times it, it got me back playing again but all of the scar tissue and and things that had actually you know been gumming up the works in my wrist remained in my wrist so um, so at, at my chiropractor, I do some chiropractic adjustments, but mostly for a long time, for most of 2017, it was, um, it was soft tissue work, ultrasound, uh, breaking up muscle adhesions, that sort of thing to actually just clear out my wrist and my forearm and my playing and my, my stamina have improved since then, aside from the fact that, you know, I my intonation still sucks and my technique is bad, but, um, <laughs> I can't, I can't blame my shortcomings on my body anymore because my body is getting treated now. We're working on it. We're trying to get it better. Um, so anyway, um, Monday morning is play with old people for two hours. Uh, go to my acupuncturist that's normally until about 1.30, and then I've got just a little bit of time to swing home, shove food in my face for about 10 minutes, and then drive uh, up the road a little bit further and go teach at a school until around 3.20. And then I, I teach there once a week, and basically after every class, the teacher and I have a miniature little discussion conference type thing about what we did that day, what we think could benefit the kids better, a game plan for getting there, pieces that we think might work, um, any repairs that might need done to their instruments because I now work at a string shop. And so that's where, you know, I've done, I used to be done Mondays at you know, 3.30 or 4 o'clock or whenever, um, whenever the teacher and I stopped talking at the junior high. But now I have a job. And although that job is open hours, like I can literally just come and go as I please. I've got my own keys to the shop. I can just come in, clock in, do
do some stuff, clock out and leave whenever I want. I want to work a lot because I want to learn. And also the shop is kind of a mess organizationally um, because we only have, I would say like four full-time employees, the owner herself, We've got a bow technician who mostly just does bow restoring and rehairing like all the time. We've got a girl uh, around my age who does, who's worked there for a couple of years. She's the shop foreman. Um, she comes in and sets cellos up and you know does repairs and, and all sorts of stuff. She's got a lot of knowledge. She's been there for a while. Um, so she just she does repair stuff. And then there's me, who I don't have any skills at all <laughs> when it comes to helping out with the actual um, repairing, rehairing, restoring bit of the business. So until I learn those skills, I'm spending my time organizing everything and and counting things, inventorying things that haven't been inventoried for months or have never ever been inventoried ever. Um, so I'm taking it upon myself to uh, to inventory basically everything because that's what businesses do. Businesses that sell things have, you know, they keep track of their inventory on all of the products they sell. So we don't end up getting an order online for strings that we go downstairs to find them and, oh no, we, we don't have that brand or that size or something. Um, I've taken care of that issue. Uh, we, we now know exactly how many of every kind of string we have in the shop for every size. And I even inventory the violin and viola strings, which have probably never been touched really like they just kind of get shoved in the drawer and they might you know get pulled out whenever they need one but it's not something that um that is frequently bought from our establishment because a surprising amount of people who have lived in this town forever don't even know that the shop exists uh which is strange because it's literally like the only shop in this town it's the only shop for about 90 miles where you can get this kind of work done and where you can get these kind of things that you need like rosin and strings and bows and rehairs um, and repairs to your instrument. You don't have to take it all the way to LA and, and be overcharged for things. We can do it right here. Uh, but the thing is that boss lady hates violins and violas because they're so small and fid fiddly. Um, and intricate. Uh, she really, I mean, aside from the fact that she just loves cellos, she loves to work on cellos and violins and violas bug her. So eventually, once I get into a rhythm of inventorying everything once a month, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get enough skills accrued, enough knowledge, repair knowledge, that when a hurt violin or viola comes to our shop we can say yeah we got a person that'll do that like linda can just you know chuck it to me she might have to you know oversee what i'm doing but she can actually be off you know churning out rehairs you know two or three an hour or something um and just talking me through what i need to do um so hopefully we'll be able to service a few more chihuahuas in our shop and get a little bit more, just a little bit more of that side of the business going. Um, so that's a 10 minute, roughly nine and a half, 10 minute um, update on what I do during the day and the evening. And uh, yeah, so let's get to talking about music now that you've sat through all of that. I'm not going to re-record this. I'm starving. I haven't eaten. I actually haven't eaten a real meal today. Um, so I'm just doing this in one take and I'm going to upload whatever it is. So, uh, practice techniques. Um, 
Wow, I hope this is still recording because my uh, my computer screen, like, it, it tried to fall asleep. Um, so, anyway, um, in my master's degree, I fell in love with music theory. And I almost, I actually did apply for a second master's degree at a few schools. Hello, Baron. Uh, I applied for a second master's degree in music theory, but then I've decided not to pursue it um, because I wanted some time off from school. My brain needed a break from school. But I still love theory, and I love doing it and analyzing pieces. So I showed this yesterday, but here's kind of another close-up view of the fugue that I, um, I sort of traced. I don't know. I can't tell if you can really see it or not. Um, I traced, I used a blue pen to trace the fugue subject all the way through, um, through the entire piece. Uh, there's a section, uh, quite a large section where it disappears, but it's, you know, down here in all these chords, but it's not really kind of anywhere else on the second page, and it doesn't come back until halfway down the bottom of the third page. Anyway, um, so analyzing the piece is a way that I like to practice it because analyzing, getting a really like in-depth knowledge of the structure of the piece, um, the, the chordal structure, the melodic structure, any, the formal structure, it, anything that might help me to memorize the piece a little better or, or just learn how it fits together is really beneficial. Also, if I'm, I don't listen to recordings a whole lot when I analyze, but there is a fair amount of, of listening in theoretical analysis because a big thing that my, um, my professors in grad school pushed for was only analyze the things that you can hear. You can go super micro theory and you know micro analysis on things, but especially on twentieth century music. But if if you can't hear those things, then there's kind of no reason to go that far in the analysis. So that's why my my first step with the Chacon is just to put, um, sorry, I'm not good at doing this backwards. I've, I'm recording it um, through my computer, which is why the quality is worse, apparently. Um, but I wanted to be able to see what I'm doing and making sure that everything I show you is on camera. So I'm just making a line, a pencil line, where the actual structural cadences are in this first little bit of the Chacon because it's really important to figure out what is an actual functional cadence and what is kind of an abandoned cadence. I'm not sure if I'm using that term correctly. It's been a couple of years since I've actually gone hardcore into, uh, into Kaplan's formal function theory. And this is Baroque music and Kaplan's theory is meant for classical music. Um, but some of the things still apply. I, I applied Kaplan's terminology and techniques to Baroque music before in, in a project, in a paper. So he's got these things where cadences that don't, that don't end really, like that they aren't the end of something. Um, an example in the Chaconne would be in measure 42, there is you know, D to C sharp to D, there's that um, D minor motion that you tend to get for uh, for a, a D minor cadence, but it, the, it just goes on, it just keeps going, it's a whole bunch of 16th notes, and sometimes you can find a moment of repose in those, but I'm not sure that that one is, is a moment to end. I think it's a moment of emphasis, but the line keeps going and that, 
the harmonic trajectory doesn't actually find a resting place until measure 49, I believe, 50 something. Anyway, um, so analysis is, is a way, or just generally like staring at the music, fingering along on my arm. I did this a lot when I was uh, flying around to grad school auditions, um, fingering along while I'm listening to the piece. But the thing that I have problems with is I tend to come up with a different interpretation than every interpretation that's recorded by a famous person ever. So listening to those recordings is kind of difficult for me because it's not how I imagine the piece. It's not how I want to play the piece. So it's kind of tough. Um, so another thing that I use in my practice is this um, nifty gadget, the iPad Pro. And it has saved, it has saved my butt, honestly. Um, it's phenomenal, I love it. It's, it's the best thing. Um, so I mentioned, I think it was yesterday about um, about practicing Stravinsky and how Baron didn't really like it. What is he eating? Oh no, Baron is eating a paycheck. Hold on. You need to stop that. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, back to this. I'm a little jerk. Um, so I was practicing Stravinsky because I have a concert coming up in February where I'm playing his symphony in three movements. And I was talking to the friend that I carpool with and he asked, have you started looking at the music yet? And I was like, no, that concert is a month away. What are you talking about? I honestly didn't even know what the program was. So I checked the email and it's Tchaikovsky's symphony number no. four and this Stravinsky symphony. And when I saw Stravinsky, I said, hmm, I need to practice that. And then immediately remembered, hmm, <laughs> Stravinsky's not public domain, so how am I going to practice it until I actually get the part, which might only be a week or two before the concert. Um, so I did not much digging, honestly. All it took was typing in to Google Symphony in Three Movements, IMSLP. And of course, IMSLP doesn't have it, but a few uh, search queries down, you see NYPhil Digital Archives. And that is your new best friend for non-public domain works. Not all of them. Apparently, Shostakovich, Britain, and Copeland are not on the New York Phil Digital Archives. But there are some things that you can't find on IMSLP that you might be able to find on the New York Phil archives. Um, so that's what I did. I happened to find my part there. And if you're a clever cookie, you can figure out how to save your part, even though it, of course, it's not public domain, so you can't download it just like you can off of IMSLP. Um, but there, there is a way, if you think about it, to, uh, to save it. So I've got my part here and I was looking through it and listening and it's Stravinsky. So there's some crazy time signature changes in it and crazy annoying rhythms and stuff. So I tried playing through it for a little bit and it was like not going well. So I put my violin down and I sat there. At, let's see here. I'm looking at Rehearsal number seven through 13. Uh, there's a whole bunch of four, four, three, four. It's only two triplets of, of a beat and then the and of the beat. And it, when you listen to it enough, it's a groove and you can, you can feel it. And especially once you just get a little bit comfortable with it. But I was, when I was looking at it at first and listening to it, I was like, how the heck am I ever going to do this? Just about, 10 minutes of, of steady focus on it 
really I can play it now it's not going to be an issue although I might get sucked into people around me making mistakes I have a tendency to to second guess myself a lot or just go with the pack if everybody else in my section is doing the wrong thing there's no sense in me being the one person doing it right because it's it's not helping anyone um so one of my favorite things to do is to actually practice conducting the piece this is especially for modern works or things with lots of crazy rhythms and time signature changes. Uh, I did this for Shostakovich 12, whichever one I played in September, uh, 12 or 13. Um, the, once, you, once that gets going fast in the first movement, there's five eights and three fours and five fours and all sorts of four four it's, it's crazy and it was really kind of difficult to feel for a while so I just sat down and I keep listening to the recording and I conduct along with it so that's what I did for that was my first bit of study for rehearsal 7 to rehearsal 13 is just being able to conduct the part not even say it while I'm conducting just one two three four one two three one two three four just being able to say the beats and conduct it correctly I was also having problems just conducting the first page and feeling the first page correctly and uh, so that's a whole other thing but this is actually rhythmically difficult and there is my 1030 birth control alarm so I really need to wrap this up um, so I, I practiced conducting it and then I was in marching band. Uh, my screen went asleep again, so I'm gonna hope that it is still recording and nothing crazy happened. Um, I was in marching band for nine years, so it's really ingrained into me that left is one, right is two, left is three, right is four. So I can either march to help me figure out what the heck I'm doing but with this particular section, there's so much switching between 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 that marching wasn't going to help. So I kind of marched with my hands. I patted my lap. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. And it was, I was always getting 3-1 to make sure that I was feeling that and figuring that out. And after I got the feel of the time signature changes, putting the rhythm to it wasn't hard at all. Um, so that's kind of my practice techniques, basically the stuff that I do when I'm not actively, um, uh, holding the violin and trying to slam my way through something. Um, I listen to it a lot for orchestral works. I listen a lot and conduct along, um, I also play along with orchestra recordings a lot. I don't, I don't learn my piece by ear. I don't learn my part by ear. Some people might do that. There's no problem with that. Sorry, there's like barren hair in my eyelashes. Um, there's no problem with learning your part by ear, except for the fact that uh, if you can't also sight read your part. If you're, or if you can't read your part at all, that's an issue um, at my level anyway. Um, so you want to work on your reading skills and your sight reading ability. But you know, I just I play along with recordings to get the feel of what it's going to be like with all the other parts. Um, to get a feel for the tempos that I'm going to have to learn and basically to find the spots where it's going to be really easy to make mistakes which in this particular the first movement of the Stravinsky is uh, there's a, a lot of room for pitfalls between rehearsal 40 and 57 because the two violin parts aren't always together and then it only gets worse <laughs> starting at rehearsal 61 through 69 there's a whole bunch of time signature changes a whole bunch of time signature changes and the violins aren't always playing together 
and I would not have been able to figure that out just by listening to a recording, maybe if I watched a video, but um, if, you know, if the camera was on the wrong section at that particular moment, I wouldn't have known that in a few of these bars, the first violins and the violas both start before me, but second violins are at a different time in the bar. So that's going to be something that is really easy to get sucked into when it, it's really fast at that point. So for right now, it's hard for me to count it. Um, yeah, so when the first violins and the violas are doing something together, you would think that the second violins should go with them, but we don't in a few places. And the way that I know that is because I went back to the New York Phil archives and I downloaded the score, um, or rather managed to save the score in my sneaky day way. Uh, so I, I saved the full score and I, 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 you know, flicked through it to the point where I'm really confused and I haven't been able to, to be on beat with the recording ever and I, I don't know what's going on. And unfortunately I had to pack up and leave and go do something right when I had this epiphany. But I, I looked at the score and I saw, oh, we're not together. <laughs> that solves a lot of problems. So I'm sure that most of the people <laughs> in the orchestra. It's a training orchestra down in LA and they're all, most of them are current college students. So they've got, you know, other stuff on their plate in addition to learning this program in four days, five days um, of rehearsals. That is, we hopefully will get the music before the first rehearsal. Um, I doubt that many of them are going to go this hardcore into trying to find their parts online and do research into when they when their entrances are and when they are and are not with other people in the orchestra but it's something that I've always kind of been driven to do is to just I like being really prepared. I like showing up at the first rehearsal actually really solid with my part and it really upsets me when I don't have time to prepare ahead of time. So this is the Stravinsky and the Tchaikovsky are two things that I'm going to be adding into my practice mix along with the Kachaturian which I will be performing at the end of the month. Um, also, I'm going to be doing a children's concert a um, couple weeks from now. And so there's going to be a few things in that that I will probably need to look at. I got the Boeings recently and it's like some stuff from the planets. It's It seems to be mostly excerpts of real classical works, but very small excerpts from uh, larger classical works. So I'm not too worried about them because it'll be small chunks of things rather than learn an entire Stravinsky symphony and an entire Tchaikovsky symphony all while I'm trying to rebuild my basic technique. That's These LA weeks are when when that really gets pushed is I want to be playing in first position and maybe third position, but I want to be working on my hand frame and my, my reliability of intonation. And then I have to go play Stravinsky <laughs> and I suddenly all of these things that I've been working on in my personal practice, all of the basic techniques that I'm trying to, perfect all of that goes out the window because you got to play Stravinsky and it's hard and it's crazy and you just have to do it somehow and so and then I get sucked back down into playing with poor technique no matter how hard I try because there will inevitably be passages that I can't play with my perfect new little hand frame and nail the intonation every time it's going to go by too fast and I don't have enough time to put into it 
to perfect that and everything else. So, um, anyway, this, I don't know, kind of a mini lecture video is now a half hour long according to the little counter on my computer. So, um, I will stop it here and endeavor to get something recorded tomorrow, some actual violin playing. I did play viola today, so it's not that I didn't play anything all day. I even played some crappy violins that we were working on setting up in the shop. Um, we were, you know, checking bridge heights for playability and stuff. So I, I did sort of almost play violin for about five minutes today. <laughs> um, but I, I will work, I will, I will do better tomorrow. So, until then, I apologize that the end of the first week was a bust. I didn't get to play or record myself playing seven days in a row. But I had a really great morning on viola this morning, so I'm not too upset. Uh, we played... I'm actually not sure where it falls. Uh, I don't remember the opus number. I'm not sure I ever noticed the opus number, but we played a Mendelssohn quartet this morning and I was having a spot on viola day today. So I don't feel too bad because I did play something and it was good. <laughs> so I will be back tomorrow on day eight with some sort of violin noises. Um, <laughs> until then, see ya.